Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal Boys and Girls. My name is Ty Hildebrand. Joining me as always, my good friend, soon to be married, co-host, his name is Dan Rubenstein. Don't forget, you can find us out on Facebook and Twitter, as well as on Apple Podcasts and our website at www.solidverbal.com. Sir, drumroll, please. It's the big week for you. Because we're speaking with Yogi Roth? Well, <laughs> not just that, but how are I hope you? everything goes all right with the wedding. I'm good, Ty. I had a bit of a, a suit issue Uh-oh. this morning that had to be solved. It, I think it's going to be solved. I'll confirm it after, <laughs> after we're done recording here. It's Tuesday evening. Did they give you tails by mistake? Not tails, but sleeves that were too short. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I wear... A, 38 regular and i think it was a 38 short jacket okay you know for an athlete you know a lengthy athlete like myself right right um so i had to make a quick run and got a lot of apologies got a free tie out of it tie so that's a good omen good or good sign so i think everything is taken care of but i'm good i just want to get it over with well i'm I'm excited i'm excited to be part of it we'll be out there uh partaking in the festivities this weekend so there will be a full recap at some point or another. Again, mm-hmm. don't forget to subscribe to the show. We're free. We're every week here in the off season. Is there a is there a wedding pool? Well, I was going to ask you about that. Okay. Would you like me to put one together? Um, I generally sure. don't do it unless I have express consent from one of the two who is actually uh, getting married. <laughs> Uh, yeah, as long as you don't interrupt the the proceedings by yelling something out and trying to affect things. No, no, I'm no. Fine. The entire the believe me, I've got this down to a science. It'll be very okay. stealthy. I'm I'm fine with it. I'll see what I can put together and, and live your out. best life. I'm really excited because I'm not married for another five or six, uh, four or five days, something like that. But we've got a really good show tonight. I'm particularly excited for this one. We do. So a couple weeks ago, we put together a special production talking about how college football coaches get hired. Uh, We've got a bunch of great ideas for how college football works, and it's not just how coaches get hired. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tonight's a show where maybe we didn't put all the production elements into it, but the quality of the content that I think you're going to get in return makes it well worth the free price of admission here on the show Mm -hmm. We've invited Yogi Roth back from Elite 11, from the Pac-12 Network. Uh, Yogi is one of the more interesting and optimistic gentlemen you'll ever have an opportunity to meet. Mm -hmm. And we brought him on to talk about all things quarterbacking, particularly you're a new quarterback. What happens next? I mean, there's, let's see, if you look across, and I apologize for focusing in on Power 5 conferences because a lot of what I think we're going to talk about touches is sort of universal. But when you look across the bigger teams, the bigger conferences, you have Clemson, Kelly Bryant looks to be the starter, but either way, there will have a new full-time starting quarterback after Deshaun Watson takes off. North Carolina, you know, Mitchell. <laughs> Maybe mm. we just call him Mitchell. Maybe we don't even say his last name. We just really hone in on that. He's like Pele, yeah. Exactly. So you have you know, North Carolina, you have Virginia Tech. You look across Big 12, not a lot of new starters, but Will Greer is a new starter for West Virginia, but a, not a new starting quarterback for college football. Texas Tech working in somebody. So across the league, and we've seen the, the quarterbacks in L.A., Josh Rosen as a true freshman, Sam Donald last year as a redshirt freshman. So more and more quarterbacks are being thrown onto the field early on. And some of them sink, some of them swim, some of them completely thrive, and some of them completely tank. But what's interesting is Yogi's background with the Elite 11, you know, what nobody watches more quarterback play probably than Yogi Roth, just in general, that exists. Um, his perspective on what it means to be a new starting quarterback, especially with modern day pressures with what playing football actually means schematically in 2017 with just the, the mental side of things and the, the challenges that are thrown at you on the field. I think it's really interesting to sort of figure out where these quarterbacks heads are at early on in their development. So let's dive in. We're going to talk to Yogi Roth 
see if we can gain some insight into how it works if you've been named a new starting quarterback, either as a freshman, as a transfer, or maybe someone who's been on the same team for a couple of years and finally is getting their chance. We'll get into that here momentarily, Dan, but I do need to mention this before we go any further. Please. Do you, ha- do you have a dress shirt? Um, well, I have. I now have multiple dress shirts thanks to a new friend of ours. Is this so? I Well, I am about to have. I have not yet received it, but I am, as our friends at the Men and Blazers would say, I'm tingling, Ty. I'm very yeah. excited for this new dress shirt to arrive. From Proper Cloth, right? Yeah, absolutely. Proper Cloth makes finding a dress shirt that fits you perfectly easy as can be. Whether the collar is too tight for you normally or the sleeves are too long or just something's way off. Now, ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to Proper Cloth. All mm-hmm. you got to do is go to propercloth.com. You can easily create a custom shirt size in just seconds. You answer 10 easy questions. It is a foolproof process. Dan, is that accurate? It's completely simple. I loved it. You don't even need a measuring tape. Plus, they have over 500 fabric styles you can choose from, including premium Italian and Japanese fabrics, as well as business and casual styles, all starting at just 85 bucks. Best of all, they guarantee a perfect fit, which means if somehow you get it, it doesn't fit perfectly, they promise to remake it for free. They are the highest rated custom shirt maker on all of the Google sphere, Dan. This is true. And I this is a totally true story. I asked uh, Jesse Palmer, ESPN college football analyst. So everybody likes to make fun of his suits and the way he dresses. Uh, they're like, oh, his suits are too tight. So I asked him about it. And he was like, it's not that my suits are too tight. It's that my body has very strange shapes. Hmm. So I have to get custom made shirts. So the fact is that because they look at his body and it looks weird, all that means is he actually has a shirt, a custom-made shirt that's doing its job by fitting him precisely. So if you have a weird-shaped body, get yourself a custom shirt and do it right. And people will look at you and say, he's shaped weird, but I know that because he has good taste. It's the future of shirts, suffice yes. to say. Propercloth.com, P R O. P-E-R, cloth.com, slash solid. Go there today. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Start Mm -hmm. looking your best with a custom-fitted shirt. Don't forget propercloth.com slash solid. If you enter the gift code solid, you will save 20 bucks on your first shirt. It's a pretty good deal. Custom fit. Save 20 bucks on your first shirt. Propercloth.com slash solid. The gift code is solid. Do it today. Yeah, it's been years. You've kept saying, I need Japanese cloth. That's right. My name is Ty Hilton Brandt, yep. and I will not settle for domestic cloth. And now your answers, your prayers have been answered. On that note, without further ado, let's talk all things about being a new college football quarterback here to help us understand how that works. Yogi Roth. Sir, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We're doing well. Dan's about to get married. <laughs> I know, I'm kind of pumped, man. I'm really excited for you. Um, I feel like we've all been on the journey, right? Because you guys sure. allow us to be there on the pod. Mm-hmm. But also, creatively, I'm not sure if your video has been released or not, but the process in which you got engaged to me as a creative, um, I love it. I think it's freaking awesome. Did it warm um, your heart? Did I did I pull it off? Oh, you, you, yeah. You Not only did you warm the heart, but I mean, you chilled up, uh, chilled up the spine, you know? And, oh, and, wow. uh, yeah, I mean, I think, and I'm going to blow Dan up a little bit here, but I think that you you come off and you're 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 funny, you're smart, like you've got some good one liners, you got great depth to your analysis and perception of the game. Love but it. deep down, you are a full on rom com, emotional, <laughs> uh, vulnerable man. And some of us, I'm not sure how many people got to see that, but uh, we got to see that side of you, and I appreciate being on the journey. Listen, Yogi, be cool. I'm trying to keep this my my reputation as being a, a stone face killer alive. No, I I I am a I'm a teddy bear. I'm a soft person. So thank you very much. Ty Ty's not bad himself. Ty, we will, you we won't no. It is it is your time to shine, Mr. Rubens This we'll is get, true. We'll get words of optimism from the most optimistic person we've ever had on the program. That's after true. After we get done talking about the topic at hand, mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago we talked about how coaches get hired in college football. Yes. Today, 
we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we want to talk about what it's like to be a new starting quarterback in the college football ranks. So you could be a freshman, you could be a five-star recruit, you can be a two-star recruit, or you could be the type of quarterback who's been on the pine for a couple of years and yeah. you finally get your shot. So we brought on Yogi, who knows pretty much everything there is to know about quarterbacks. And I guess we'll start here, Yogi. The traditional path, at least when Dan and I came up with the idea for this show, is you're a highly touted prospect. Perhaps you go through the Elite 11 system. Everyone in the college football ether knows who you are. You pick your school. You get out there on the field. What is the most noticeable difference between really high level high school football and you know traditional power five d1 college football um a lot i mean from a game standpoint um I, one of my favorite things it's kind of like the old uh the old movie we love hoosiers right and you, you know you go to the big gym and you get the guy on your shoulders and how's that how high's the rim 10 feet how long is the floor? 90, you know, like, and I think the game is still the same, right? It's, you know, the width of the field is the same, the length of the field, the goalposts. Um, and when you get there, um, it's the same game we've been playing and, and ideally the quarterback position has fallen, fallen obsessively in love with. Um, but so many things change. And of course it's obvious to state the speed, the size, the, uh, the ability to have an anticipatory skill that can operate in that environment. But, but really for me, where I always go and where I've gone more and more being around this game is mastery of your voice. And so much so it's going to be a theme this year with the Elite 11 when they get there um, here in, in two weeks or so, and the finals are in Los Angeles. Um, and, and it comes down to obviously the basis of decision making. And that carries across all elements of your life, right? Whether that's on the field, off the field, third down, red zone, backed up, et cetera. But, but I think that it really comes down to do you have ownership over who you are? And that is a hard thing to do because let's just play it out step by step, right? Uh, I'm going to be a 14 year old and I'm offered uh, by a big time school. And all of a sudden, Tate Martell, when he got offered by Sark at UW at 14, his life changed. And, and that happens more and more and more and more now. And you add in the early signing period, et cetera, early visits, it's only going to get earlier. So now, who I am perceived to be and who I am become two different things. And to me, that's the hardest part for a student athlete, because a lot of times they just want to be a kid again. And sometimes they act that way and then they get burned. Um, and I think it's a tough place that we put them in as um, you know, a football society in terms of a kid gets to be on campus. And as your question stated, OK, now it's time for you to be the starter and they're not allowed to be a 19 year old. You know, they're, they're expected to be a starter and what that entails is maturity, great decision making, be in the face of the program, not only do the interviews post game, but go ahead and do all the community events, uh, go to the head coach or the booster events, make sure you get straight A's because that's a quarter, what a quarterback does. And oh, by the way, live in the facility while trying to maintain a high GPA because our quarterback needs to be a 3.5 or higher because that's just what you're accustomed to. And that can send a lot of different messages to a student athlete and does. And if they don't do the work <clears throat> around who they are, what they're about, what motivates them, you know, what I call is what their story is, um, then they can be lost. And their fall from grace, which happens to all of us because the game decides when it's done with us, and whether that's Brett Favre, who I had a chance to meet for the first time, interview him a couple weeks ago, the game decided when it was kind of done with him, and he was the guy who played longer than anybody. Um, or a guy like me, when your career just ends and it just ends, um, you, you don't get to choose. And the fall, in my opinion, is getting harder and harder when careers end and the ceiling that they're on top of or the, the floor that they're on in the proverbial building gets higher and higher and higher because of all the attention. And if you don't know who you are, you're screwed. Um, and I think that happens when you start, when you get benched or you get injured or you win or you lose and then ultimately when your career is over. So that to me is the work that I think is most critical um, to at least get started on prior to becoming the face of a power five big time program. Yeah. And by the way, Yogi, that's not an easy thing to do for a lot of regular college students. Going to college to find yourself is one of the primary focuses of going away to school. You layer on top of that all of the attention that comes with playing at a major institution, all of the trappings of being a freshman, needing to learn to manage your time, both in the classroom, on the field, and otherwise, and everything else that goes with that new environment. 
that is not very easy to accomplish. What kind of support do programs offer to try and cultivate that maturity? It's a great question because coaches are recognizing this, and definitely in the Pac-12 conference, who I think are further along um, in elements off the field um, and just in the communities of those campuses, a little further along than some other places around the country. That's not a knock. I think that's just the reality of being in major metropolitan areas and the students that you're attracting from all over the globe, you know, kind of raises everybody's game or right? Stanford's the easy example. Um, but I've been on pretty much every campus this off season. And, and obviously over the last, you know, nine plus years as an analyst and, and they're, and they're doing the work to do it. The, the challenge is it's kind of the good with the bad, right? You're only allowed 20 hours per week. Um, and, and if I'm a football coach, like I want to teach my guy ball. Right. Um, so how much might I dedicate that to the other side? Uh, guy who does it, I think as well as anybody is Chris Peterson. You know, they got real life Wednesdays. You know, I was just up there and spoke at one last week um, and they talk everything with their kids and, and he'll bring them in for, you know, sometimes five minutes after a workout or he will, uh, you know, bring in a guest speaker like me for an hour um, to, to hit a different topic. And, and he goes across the board. And I think it's kind of like, um, you know, when a freshman comes in as a quarterback, the, the first thing you teach him is you know, how to take a snap. You know, how do you want their feet and the shotgun or under center, dependent upon your system, right? How, how are you identifying a linebacker? How are you getting in the play? What's the cadence? Um, even when they're a senior day one install, the great coaches I'm around, they, they still teach that, right? It's kind of the way you do small things, the way you do all things. And to me, it's like you have to continue to teach and harp and teach and harp on what it means to be a real man, teach and harp and teach and harp on what it means to deal with finances, teach and harp and teach and harp on what it means to find your voice. I mean, you just have to keep doing it um, because they don't just get it. And that's scientifically proven as the brain doesn't fully develop till we're 25. And, and I do it with corporations around the country in the off season. And, you know, hard for a college kid. It's hard for a 45 year old, you know, to go through the process and say, this is what I stand for. This is what I'm about. This is my voice. And I'm going to gain mastery over it. Um, and, it. And it's hard to do. And it's always evolving. But to me, as long as you're doing the work, um, then that's what's that's what's most meaningful because it's gonna get hard. You know, we used to always say it at SC, and you know, obviously that program is a spotlight. I've always felt when you play quarterback there and you sign out of high school, you're a household name. You know, the country knows Jack Sears, but when you start, you become a Heisman candidate, and you got to be ready for that. And that is really hard to do. So you've got to kind of do the work with the student athlete when they get there, because the quarterback, as you guys know, and your listeners, I'm sure know, they're the only one that feels the pressure like a head coach feels it. And it's not exactly the same, but it's the closest. And they're kind of in a foxhole together. You know, they're kind of in that bunker together when it gets hard, specifically at a great place. And that's why one of my favorite questions to ask kids when I get on campus is what's that relationship like? And for, for a, a fifth year senior and a head coach who come together throughout the whole thing, like how is it developed? You know, how do you deal with him as, as a young kid? And there's so many great stories in the history of college football about, you know, quarterback way back in the day, walking to their coaches office, hey, man, you, you can't talk that way um, to me in front of the team. Uh, you can rip me all you want in your office because I need to make sure, you know, I can still be the guy in front of them or vice versa. And, and I think that's a coach's job is to learn their learner, which allows them in turn to you know, kind of figure out how to, how to help them and teach them uh, to find their voice. So we're now watching a sport yogi in which – the expectation is now that a quarterback who comes in as a true freshman, a redshirt freshman, we saw, you know, Jameis Winston, we see Marcus Mariota, we see the quarterbacks in L.A. succeed almost immediately. What do you credit that early success with? What do you credit that early success? And when you look around college football, where where do the expectations get out of hand, I guess? And, and why is that early success a thing, whereas it didn't used to be a thing. You know, is it is it sort of the preparation that they're getting in high school that's better? Is it the fact that coaches are getting better, you know, teaching and speaking with and learning the language of younger players? What what is this sort of attribution to that early success? It's it's a great question. Um, I, I think that a, there's 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 a few major elements to that. I can remember starting the Elite Eleven nine years ago when I jumped on and joined the, the staff and went down to Texas. And two years later, went back down to Texas and it was like a TCU camp or something. I was like, wow, they're way better this year than they were a couple of years ago. And it kept getting better and better. And you dive deeper and deeper. And all of a sudden you saw that seven on seven was kind of thing. So the kids in fourth grade, it wasn't just you're the best athlete play quarterback. It was like, 
you're the best athlete. You can throw the ball and I'm teaching you cover too. I mean, it just became the evolution of Friday night tykes, good, bad, and different football has become something taught much younger. Um, so I think there's that. I think high school coaches um, are really soaking up information. College coaches are smart. I mean, doors are open everywhere across the country to come in and learn and teach. And then, of course, the game has shifted. Um, the, the reality is, is that it's an easier game to play right now um, at that position. And the way it's being taught, and this isn't a knock, is the way that it's being taught a lot of times is, okay, where can we find success and put our best player on the field? And to do that, it's kind of like what you used to do with running backs when they got to college. When you get a great running back, like when Reggie came in to SC, it was, all right, let's give him five plays. You know, he doesn't know everything. Give him five plays. You know, let's make sure he can play at the speed he's capable of on those plays. Okay, cool. The next year, let's give him 25 plays. You know, all right, now third year, give him everything. You know, so there's a progression. And I think it's the same thing at the quarterback because of what the spread has allowed you to do. So if you put yourself in the position of a coach and let's just get a job at a power five school, not Ohio State, SC, Texas, right? Not elite Alabama, one of those places where you can get the O line and get all the positions to, to run whatever offense you want. Well, what are you going to run? You know, you're going to run. You're going to run an advent of the spread. You're going to run a place where you don't have to make full field reads. You're going to run a system where you can make the green grass rule and get the ball out. You're going to run a place where, okay, hey, I mean, my receivers, they're going to play right. Um, outside wide receiver, they can play right slot receiver, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's where they're going to become experts. You know, Oregon had done that obviously in the past of I'm going to be so good and I'm going to over rep the, the daylights out of this system so I can kind of just operate in that world. Now, when does it get hard? It gets hard when all of a sudden what you expect doesn't happen. And I was talking to guys in the NFL this year about quarterbacks and, and drafting them. And they said, you know, at this specific team, they were like, man, it's going to be hard for us to ever draft a quarterback because when you come out of college, you go to, you know, George or Jordan or one of the incredible quarterback builders that, that all these guys go to and they get taught all the stuff, right? They get taught the fronts and how to read them and the coverages and everything goes, but you don't really know it because you haven't done it. You know, your 10,000 hours of playing the position are legit, but they're not necessarily changing protections, resetting fronts, you know, identifying them, let alone operating in real time against them. So it, it's just, it's just such a big learning curve. And in this era of coaching, you don't have the time, which is why I go back to the question, what would you run if you're in college? Well, I want to get to seven wins. I want to get to nine wins. How can I do it? Right. Well, let's get the ball out. And I think that's important to note um, in terms of why guys are having success. And, and it is the simplification of a lot of these offenses. Um, and that's just, to me, the, the truth of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's the reality. Fair enough. And so when you see these super young quarterbacks, another one, obviously, Deshaun Watson, who had a lot of success early on at Clemson and went on to win a national championship. When you see these guys as as freshmen or redshirt freshmen, first year starting, you know, still really new to the, the field in game play. What are you shocked to see? What floors you to see, you know, this guy's 19 and he's already doing this. What does an advanced freshman or an advanced redshirt freshman, as silly as that term sounds like, you know, is it is it progressions? Is it being able to sort of figure out disguised coverages and, and blitzes? Is it poise and calm that should come later? What is what is a special advanced freshman, redshirt freshman look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a fun conversation. I, I to me, um, because of the stages they've been put on in high school, um, those stages aren't that big, you know, because they don't know any better. You know, you look at Sam Darnold last year, he just kind of went out and balled. You know, you look at Shane Bouchelle last year, you know, he didn't flinch. You know, they're, they're, it just wasn't too big of an environment for them. To me, the, the fun study is second year players. And a lot of times, second year quarterbacks specifically, whether it's Richard sophomores or true sophomores, um, they struggle. And a lot of that, and at least in my opinion, based on talking to people and, and being around them is all of a sudden now the, uh, all the stuff grows around them, right? I hate to use the term noise, but I'm going to use it, right? All the noise kind of grows. And I can remember talking to a second year quarterback last year and he said, uh, he goes, you know, when I, when I came back, they were like, okay, you gotta be the leader here. And which is totally fair. Okay. You're the quarterback. Let's, let's be loud now. And he goes, man, I got like 50 or seniors here and nobody really taught me how to do that. 
you know, so we go back to the high school level of we're repping the daylights out of things and all these seven on seven tournaments. But again, that's why I, I, I know I work with Elite 11, but I'll get on the table for us. I don't think anybody in the high school space is doing what we do beyond the X's and O's. You know, a lot of guys can teach football beautifully, but what we do on the sports psychology front, on the mental training front, on the domestic violence front, on you know the the 360 evolution of quarterback, and we only get it for about 10 days or so at the Elite 11 finals in the opening, but at least gets them going a little bit. And then the coaches obviously in college do a phenomenal job of taking it to the next level with all the resources these places have with guest speakers and different curriculum, et cetera. But my point is, is that the second year, all of a sudden it's like, Whoa, I don't, I'm not just playing, you know, I got all this other crap I got to go do. And that's part of it. I mean, it's kind of, we call it an elite 11 Trent. It's his phrase. He's, you know, it's you embrace the burden of influence because that's what you have at the quarterback position. And that to me is, Way more interesting than oh my god, why is he ripping it as a first year player? Yeah, his his progressions are great, his anticipatory skills are great. And coaches are calling it to the skill set. Sam, you could do anything with him because he's an elite player. Josh was the same way as a true freshman. Josh Rosen. Some guys you got to tailor what you can what you can call and, and where you want to go on based on obviously game situation specific down and distance etc. But to me, it's the second year is a study. Okay. Now, how have you dealt with this? How have you handled this? Cause it isn't just, let me go ball, right? There's more to the position. There's more to the expectation. There's more to being on the front of the poster. There's more to being on the billboard. There's more to being all the interviews. There's just more to it. Um, and, and you got to deal with that. And, and to me, that is the funnest part of being able to coach quarterbacks or be a coordinator or obviously be a head coach and kind of be lockstep and guide this young man to that place. And, and that's where you see some guys go off the rails. We've seen that before. And we see some guys struggle and we see some guys thrive. And um, it, it's going to be a new thing. I'm really tuned into um, after this last year of second year players and really evaluating the mental side of their growth as a performer versus just, Oh my God, they've got full mastery of the whole playbook. Like, no kidding. Like they better have that, you know, like welcome to the, the position that's your job. We've talked about some rather deep subjects here, so not to oversimplify, but you mentioned the playbook. I'm fascinated by the verbiage, the terms that are required just to make the offense purr. What are the tricks to getting a freshman, to getting a first-year starting quarterback to not only understand what the plays mean and how they work, but also simply memorize all the terminology so that they can properly call out the plays? Yeah, well, you know, you got to give uh, so many of these coaches such their kudos in terms of. I really think coaches, especially on the offensive side, have really leaned into how the brain works. So there's this theory called the scientific mind. It's, it's kind of a nerdy article, but I can remember reading it 10 years ago, and it was about how the brain works in clusters. And it's basically the idea of the brain works in clusters of five, or excuse me, of seven plus or minus two. So five, seven, nine, like those are kind of the clusters we can remember. So the the easy comparison is when you were a kid, at least us, like we remembered our our phone numbers, right? And we remembered seven numbers, you know, for the most part, we, we didn't, we didn't have a cell phone, you know, you just kind of remembered your boy's number and five, six, three, two, four, nine, whatever. And you just kind of went away with it. Well, um, I think now the important thing is coaches are understanding how the brain works and, and the idea of learning your learning with these kids. They're saying, okay, cool. What, what's, what's max capacity? What do they need to learn? Okay. I need to give them um, three things. I could, if you're a young guy, for instance, so I can give my quarterback basically like a picture. And this picture means uh, this is your protection. This is the, the route combination. And this is your drop. This is oversimplified. But they're going to tell the old line in the center or whoever's closest to the sideline, hey, this is the protection. And they'll verbalize that element to the old line. The receiver is the same thing. So I, I think as the progression of quarterbacks uh, in their careers at specific institutions go on, they're not asked to learn everything. And, and that is the progression of a learner. Well, some places are. Some places are like, hey, this, this is the offense. You know, Florida State, they're fun to watch because – you know, it's, it's it's good stuff they're doing there. You got caught real plays, and and I, and I say that in terms of like West Coast off and dual right Z shorty two Z snag. You know, like there's there's elements of that at some institutions, and I think that other institutions kind of get uh, unfairly lambasted for you know they're they're just you know we just think that they just call red right and that's a play. You know, some places yes, but I, I think it's way more complex than than we give them credit for at times. Uh, but overall, for the quarterback. You learn it because it matters. 
you know, we do a talk with, with kids all the time uh, about like how much you love something and what that really looks like, you know, truly it's not just, you know, it's like the Tom Herman professor last year when he's like, we don't just say, I love you, man. Like we like love each other. Right. Like remember that fun little bit. Right. Well, then it's the same thing with the game. You know, if you have the agape love for the craft, then you go hard at it. And I do think it's important for these coaches and they're doing it. Uh, there's a, there's a school in the sec that, that to me, it was amazing when I heard what they did. They, uh, they gave a quarterback test to a young man on paper and he really struggled. They gave the same test to him on an iPad and he got like a hundred percent. It was just like, I mean, think about it. When, if you are born in whatever, a 19 year old, whatever, I don't want to know the year a 19 year old's born right now. Cause it's going to make me feel terrible. <laughs> 1998 Yogi. Oh, all right. well, at least it's not a 2000 yet, but, um, think about it. They probably, I mean, they don't teach creative. They don't teach cursive anymore in third grade. Right. So like, how much are you really doing on paper? Not much, you know? So I, again, I go back to how guys are learning and learn your learner. And to me, the amount of teams that are studying the mental side of performance, not only as performers, but also how you become a, you know, a process-based thinker, um, and how they're doing that is, is, is across the board. And if you're not doing it, you're kind of missing the boat, you know, to be quite honest, because you're not understanding how these kids learn. And that to me is always where it's yeah, where the evolution has occurred. How similar is the verbiage between programs in your observation? Uh, it's across the board. I mean, you're going to go to Stanford, you're going to get three plays. And the thing about them that I love is that, you know, you don't play until you're, you earn the right to play and you're ready. You know, other places could be like, dude, this guy can rip. Let's get the ball in his hand. Let's see what happens. Right. This guy's going to make things happen. Right. I mean, we've, we've seen that happen across the country and those teams start out hot and they go four and oh, five and oh, and the guy's got featured on game day or whatever. And then they lose three straight. You know, it's just kind of like the, there, there's a reason why Oklahoma is the only team in the history of college football to have a true freshman ride, you know, outside of obviously what it even hurts last year. Right. They go all the way till the end, but um, you got to have so many other tools in your toolbox to be able to protect that position just because of the reality of what kids know coming in and, and what the expectation is from, from these offensive minds now that are already on the offensive side in college football. So I, th- I think it varies, man. I really do. I think that um, the depth of it though is like, it's, it's unfair. Like we could look at Texas tech for instance, or Wazoo and be like, you know, man, they just have 12 plays. Right. And, and I think that gets thrown out sometimes, but when you dive into it, it's not really the truth. Right. Like you could say Jake Spavadol's offense is the easiest in the country. Well, not really. You know, when you, when you really dive into what he's teaching Will Greer at West Virginia. Right. And I think so on and so forth, we can go around the conference and the country because now in recruiting, again, it comes back to, okay, yeah, you can go throw for 2,500 yards, man, but you're going to get to the league. And in this quarterback arms race, like you got to prove that you can do it. And and we saw it on the offensive line and you've seen shifts and how teams kick slide versus just pass set in spread offenses over the last couple of years, because they were missing offensive linemen and recruiting. Like that is a shift that has happened. And, and the same thing in the quarterback space of you got to prove to me how I'm going to evolve because the draft kind of speaks for itself. You know, unless you are crazy ceiling, freaky athlete, um, insane competitor, like you better know football, Deshaun baller. And you, know, you look at the guys that got drafted less up this last year to me, it was, you know, it got uh, a lot of slack, but it's a really deep quarterback class um, in terms of, to me, the, the potential ceiling of these guys, but also more importantly, their, their obsessive knowledge for, for the craft. So you're a new starting quarterback, whether a freshman or someone who's been on the team for a period of time, you're now thrown into the spotlight. What is the most important relationship to build? Because you've got options. You've got an offensive coordinator and a quarterback coach, sometimes the same guy. You've got an offensive line. You've got a receiving core. You've got other quarterbacks that are behind you on the depth chart. What is the tried and true pathway besides building a great relationship with all of them, preferably? That's a great, you guys ask great questions, um, which is why I love your podcast. But I, I mean, I think when you get there, you better develop relationships with your teammates. You know, like Davis Webb's a great example, right? And granted, he was a fifth year transfer, but in two weeks, he's, you know, named captain or some, something like that last year, right? Because he's got around the guys. Like, I, I still think you come back to that. Tom Brady gave a great interview a couple of years ago. It's, it's an article we always pass out to the quarterbacks, and he talks about how, like, the QB is not an extension of the coaching staff. The QB is 
a member of the team and, and first and foremost, and that's his job to not be above anybody in that huddle on that roster in that locker room. Now his job is to champion the message from the staff, of course, but it was really cool in terms of how he reframed that. And, and I, I'd agree. Um, and, and I think coaches would agree too. you know, it's a coach's job to teach the student athlete and put them in positions to lead, you know, not necessarily to count on them to be responsible for the leading. Now, we always say that they are because that's the right thing to do and you put them in the position to continue to evolve and grow and it's a great storyline. But I think if you asked any Fortune 500 CEO, aka head coach of the Power Five, and said, okay, you're just giving the keys to your 20-year-old, 18-year-old, 19-year-old? Hell no, they're not doing it. Their job is to put them in position to thrive and make them feel as though they're driving the car, but we all know who is necessarily doing it, especially early on. So to answer the question, I think the first thing is, is your teammates. Um, especially that position, because you can get sniffed out as a pretender really quick. You fall into one of two categories, in my opinion, as a quarterback. And it's one of the first things we say to elite 11 kids is you either love what the game does for you, which is this, you know, the Instagram, the Twitter, the, you know, going on different shows, or you love what you do for the game period and a story. And, uh, and it's, it's a tough question because nothing wrong with loving what the game does for you. Like there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with loving the shine. Um, but it can't be first, you know? So to me, uh, you, you go there and then it's, it's the guy you're working with every day. I mean, they, you have to be able to be honest there. So often, um, I can remember Mitch Mustaine. I'll never forget this, uh, for the rest of my career. And do you guys remember Mitch? He was one of the most prized recruits, you know, and most in, you know, this era of college football went to Arkansas, played as a true freshman, balled out um, a lot of drama there and transfers to SC. And I'll never forget the first day we came into the quarterback room and uh, my job was to kind of, you know, say hi to him and uh, let's see where he's at. Like, what does he know? And it was so important that he could be honest. I can remember I asked him a couple just fundamental questions in our system and he, he was trying to answer. And I was like, you never been taught that before, huh? And he's like, no. And I was like, okay, cool. I was like, this is a safe space. Like you need to be able to say, I don't know. And versus I have all the answers. And that goes back to the first thing we talked about is mastering your voice. You know, so often QBs just try to, I call them political figures. You know, you just say the right thing and do the right thing. And I get it. I mean, we could almost do a funny podcast where we just get answers at press conference because we know exactly what they're going to say. You know, I want to thank my family. I want to thank God. And it's all about my teammates, right? Like we know what they're going to do. But I think in the evolution of them as players, they have to be able to be honest versus trying to always impress. And that is a, that's a cool evolutionary element because sometimes you want to be the smart guy in the room. Sometimes you want to ask questions so you look smart. I mean, all those elements and insecurities are legitimate. And I've always thought quarterbacks are like supermodels, you know, like they've got thin skin to a certain degree, you know, because they always, you know, want to want to be a rock star. And when they walk down that runway, they are rock stars. But when they trip and fall, they can go down a dark path, which we've seen with quarterbacks in college, the NFL, and even high school and recruiting. And I think you have to be sensitive to that. And, and the adult in the room is the QB coach or the coordinator. And that's the, that's the relation where you got to be super honest. Be able to be like, you know what, dude, I don't have a clue what cover two means. I have no clue how to say this play. And then it's on them to not call it and not put you in that situation your first year. And then by your third year, you might be calling the plays in the offense that you're in. Yogi, how much do you believe, if at all, in in sort of fire development and sort of saying, okay, we have this freshman who's clearly the most talented QB. He's soaking up the playbook. He, you know, he's responding. He has the respect of his teammates. But, you know, our first game of the year is against a huge team. It's, you know, it's in Baton Rouge. It's in Austin. It's in wherever. It's in Athens. And it may not do his confidence. It may not do his development the the sort of the best favors if he goes in there as his first game and struggles and maybe he he goes down from there and how much do you believe in the sort of like well it's only a matter of time before he starts so let's get him some reps on the bench sort of mental reps and then by game four we'll see where he's at is is how fine a line is that i think it's really important and that's why these coaches are really into the mental side of performance now you know, and they got to understand the insecurities that go with that and the pressures that go with that and what goes into that. And, it, it, and I think if you don't have anybody else, it makes it um, easy and easier decision. You know, the SC fans always bring it up, right? It's man. What do imagine if we started Sam against Alabama? I think they would have got smoked as well, you know, yep. week one. Um, and, and I don't think he was ready then. 
Um, and I had been at all their scrimmages and at their practices and at their press conferences. And, and I, whenever I go, I just listen. Um, and the way he talked versus the way Max Brown talked and their confidence, um, you just didn't know. You didn't know what you were going to get. Uh, and, and you thought you knew what you were going to get with Sam or with, with Max. You know, so, so you went with him. You know, if he wasn't there, then I think it's interesting, right? You play, in that instance, Jalen Green because he would have been a junior or whatever. And, you know, would have been getting the reps in training camp. I, I don't know. You, you, I think it really goes down to the psyche of the kid. And, and you got to play that out of, of who they are. And, and there's that unknown of you don't know. You know, you don't know how they're going to perform. You know, you can see it all day long. You try to recreate competitive cauldrons, which is what Bill Walsh used to call, like how you get a guy's ready and practice ready. You create all those environments and you know, situations on the practice field. Um, but if you don't have competitive depth then you don't have, you know, dudes you're going up every day, like an Alabama defense or, you know, SC this year or whoever it may be, or UW's defense, then you don't really know. So that's the beauty of the game. But to your point, I think you got to be careful. You know, you look at, I think it was Jake Browning his freshman year. And they roll him out against Boise on the road. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was Chris Peterson, like first game, right? As a head coach, might have been his first or second game. Um, and then we didn't know who was going to start and the way he goes. And, and they don't call the most aggressive game and it comes down late. And I think they ended up losing, you know, they don't, they don't convert a couple things at the end and you, know, you protect them and you play call and then it becomes a point where you say, all right, let it rip. You know, I, I think it's at every position too. I can remember when Larry Fitzgerald came to pit and, you know, unfortunately he beat me out, but you know, I was getting the burn early on and the coach was just like, is he ready to really play? And he went up to one sideline was like, I can go, we were losing in a game and he goes, I'll make the play. Like, just put me in. And I'll never forget Walt Harris looked at him. He goes, all right, it's your time. The next play called a fade touchdown career away. He went. And that was like, I think week two against Texas A&M or something like that. And they just didn't know, you know, does he know his plays? Do we trust him? Is he going to run the right route on a slant on third and two, or is he going to try to go high and we're going to be a pick six the other way? Like you just kind of don't know. And then you feel it. And, and that's why I go back to, like, and this is me on my soapbox here of, NCAA and recruiting, I think there's one more change they really need to make because they don't let these coaches really evaluate. You want an early signing period. You want all these things. Well, why can't they go to camps at like Elite 11? Why can't they get more contact around them like you can in basketball? I can be a basketball coach, head coach. I can go to Vegas and watch a kid play. I can be an assistant coach in volleyball and literally coach a high school kid who I'm recruiting at the time on a club team. But in football, I can't go watch the opening. Like I can't go learn more about my guys. You know, I only get, I can't bump them. Right? I can't talk to them when I go watch them throw. So I can watch them throw 40 times in May. Like coaches are just, just finish up doing on the road, but can't really get around them unless he can make his way to your camp. And I got to offer him all by the way in ninth grade. Like how are you really supposed to know the psyche? Um, and that to me is why there's elements of inconsistency in college football. Cause it's just, it's just hard unless you're in an elite place or you've got, you know, insane, uh, you know, uh, elements that recruits have to hit like they do at UW, for instance, you know, you don't see them with surprise recruits on signing day. They know they're 18, 20 guys because they've gone through the process and it takes them a little bit longer, but they're not going to flinch. They're probably not going to miss some places. They didn't go to the CFP last year and they got to go early on some guys. And I, I think that, that that's an element that leads to it. And it's an area that I would, um, I would love to see adjusted. You talk about the relationships between coaches and, and players in high school or lack thereof. And, and once they get on campus, and this may be somewhat of a dumb question, but I, I'm curious, to what extent will coaches, be it an offensive coordinator or a head coach, when they're with a quarterback? And you talked about sitting with Mitch Mustaine. But to what extent will they say, this is why we run this kind of play here? This is why when the defense is doing this, we attack them in this way. How much do coaches look at it in the sort of way of, well, it doesn't, it doesn't concern you why we do this. Just do this. And do the better coaches make it more clear? Does Chris Peterson, does David Shaw, does, you know, did Chip Kelly, did, you know, does Jimbo Fisher really sit down with a quarterback and say, this is why we do this and then this? Is there that element? When you're ready for it. You know, I think... You know, let's just play out the quarterback room right now. And I think this is true in the, this is definitely true in the NFL. And I believe it's true in college for the most part, you know, you're talking to your starter, you know, you know, you have to, you, know, you have to keep pushing Sam, Josh, 
uh, Jake, you know, just talking Pac-12 quarterbacks and, you know, Luke, like four of the top guys in America coming out or, you know, heading into next year. Um, you have to talk to the starter and push him. And you have got to hope that those other guys are following along. Um, and there's an element of, you know, that's when it gets hard for a lot of young quarterbacks. It's like, man, like I'm not the guy anymore. You know, I'm not getting, not getting the attention. My, my, my basic question is really basic and he ain't got time for that. Like there's, there's an element of that for sure. Um, but what I love that the answer, I did, I just bashed on him is, is the rule in the off season of, you know, you get your eight hours and coaches can kind of be around them. Now, granted satellite camps aren't helping that type of development at all. Um, because they still exist on massive levels. You know, we all think that satellite camps went away and, and they haven't, they just kind of changed some of the rules around them. So you don't get all that off season time that could help develop a young guy, but that's why you have graduate assistants and why you have uh, young coaches do it. But I, I think it's progressive based learning. I, I really do. And, and the way I have always looked at the quarterback position and receiver as well is okay, year one, it's know your assignment, right? So the QB, it's like, know the route combination you know, and know your one key All right, If it's curl flat, like who am I looking at based on one or two high? That's what I got to do. You know, cool, man. Operate there. Year two. It's okay. You know, maybe, um, you know, the linebacker being plus a little bit and the defense then being light in his stance means there's going to be a field pressure coming this way. Oh, I got you, you know, and I can come back side to my alert on a post year three. It's like, I know it's coming and I'm not only going to give you a dummy audible, but I'm giving you a dummy audible and I'm gonna come back a real audible and I'm going to throw for six. That is to me, the evolution that is just the reality of 27 practices. If you come in and aren't there early or yeah, you can go through player run practices, but you're really not getting the coaching necessary because coaches are in satellite camps. They take vacation in July and then they're getting their starter ready. Um, which is why when you see freshmen play early, it's fascinating. You know, uh, I always think that it's funny when we hear from fans of man, he's terrible. This guy can't play. And I'm just like, dude, like do you even comprehend what he's trying to get done as well as we don't even know the personal side of his life and the attention and the pressure and the expectation. And, and now they're not our age, right? They're not 40. They're not 50. They're not grown men. They're 18, 19, 20 years old in a world where I can get at you on social whenever I want. I mean, I, there was a quarterback who retired a couple of years ago and a lot of it was because he struggled with all the negativity on social media, you know, and that it, it's just real. And we can say whatever we want. You can be old school and say, Oh, he's soft. He can't play blah, blah, blah. But you're BS then and you don't get um, this generation. You know, it's why I am obs- really into watching. And I know it's touchy subject, but 13 reasons why. To me, uh, it's a beautiful element of, of giving us an insight into high school and a reminder of like, oh, yeah, that does kind of happen. Oh, man, like this, this is an element of it. And it doesn't mean you're soft as a coach. It means that you're empathetic. And then there's a big difference. You know, Jim Moore is phenomenal at that. You know, he's one of the more intimidating guys I've been around. Um, his players really want his sense of approval. But he's one of the most empathetic guys I've ever been around in terms of understanding what it like, what, what it means to be a real man in Los Angeles and a young man and, and trying to become, you know, a superstar. And, and he gets that. And I think it's undervalued with him specifically, probably because uh, you don't really talk about those stories, but the way that he handles uh, players when they go through difficult times, you know, Mike Warriors is, is, is an example. that has been written about um, he's, he's magical. He's brilliant there. And I think a lot of coaches are, are aware of that now. And, and you see them trying to coach the full 360 student athlete, and be aware of it and to answer your question on what do you teach them? You're teaching them what they can handle. And if, if you think that you're teaching them the way you call plays and the, and your understanding of 15, 20, 30 years of coaching, then you're crazy. And you're going to, kid's going to play slow and he's going to play poor. And, and I think you have to be able to adjust there or just get used to never playing a young, a young kid. Wow. This is, this is all very good, very deep stuff. Again, Yogi Roth, where, where can people find you, Yogi? What, what kind of projects are you working on that, that people can check out? Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I just did a really fun one. The answer is the Pacific Ocean, Ty. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's where you call. can find gotta, Yogi Roth. <laughs> you're gonna be, I'm going to be in the Atlantic here pretty soon. I'm going to go yes. surf uh, Bia Ritz this summer and San Sebastian. So I'm kind of pumped about that. Uh, but, <laughs> but overall, I just came back from Israel, the homeland. And uh, I went and spent time with, I'm not sure people are aware, but they have this thing called the Israeli Football League which is American football. It's owned by Robert Kraft, funded by him. 
and it's a really cool league. Um, you know, Tennessee, for instance, sent over their old jerseys when they changed from one uh, brand to another. So the whole league last year was rocking like old school Tennessee swag from spikes nice. to gloves to whatever. Uh, but it's a tackle league. It's a flag league. It's men's and it's women's. And I just did a doc series series called we all speak ball that uh, just started coming out today. Um, and we'll release all week long online. So you can find that stuff at, uh, you know, Israel 21 C is the group that did it. You can see it on all my social or, uh, at yogi rock.com. And, and then I just did a short film called, uh, what does it mean to love, which surprisingly keeps getting a ton of play every day. It's like another thousand views. And it was the same thing. I went over in Israel and I was like, man, it's the holiest place in the world, the most conflicted place in the world. And clearly with the political element that, that we're dealing with, it's, it's a touchy subject. And I was like, what if we just ask people in the old city of Jerusalem from Arabs to Muslims, to Christians, to Jews, like that one question. And, uh, it was pretty fascinating to, to hear. And, uh, you know, for me in the off season, I like diving into that side of entertainment and storytelling. And I think it only makes me a better analyst and, and more empathetic to, to the, you know, to the big picture world. Uh, when I get to dive back into football, come, you know, mid July for media days, et cetera. So that, that those two have been uh, pretty fun off season projects for me. All right. Well, we will be sure to post links on our site before we let you go. I know you're a busy guy in 30 seconds or less. I need your optimistic words of encouragement and congratulations for our soon to be married co-host. Dan, yes. Dan known you since you're a young grasshopper. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> We've been through a lot Yep, from one coast to the other, but all sure. in all, you've been a seeker. You've been a seeker of great food, mm-hmm. been a seeker of nerding out in football, mm-hmm. and you've been a seeker of an amazing partner. Fortunately, you and your beautiful soon-to-be wife have found each other, and I couldn't be more excited for the nuptials, the wedding, the dance party. And the only thing I'll leave you with is a subtle, simple reminder that the only thing that matters in life is love. And that, to me, I believe is the language of the world. The alchemist has said it best in the favorite book. Uh, I know you're a fan of it. I am as well. And I think that that is the simple joy that I hope you live with every day. I'm ready to run through a wall of love. I am ready. Shut it down, boys. (sighs) Yeah. All right. That's a a great way to go out, Ty. Thank you very much, Yogi. You got it, man. I love you guys. Okay, Dan. Again, Yogi Roth. Find him on the Pac-12 network. Mm Mm-hmm. Find him on Twitter at Yogi Roth. Yogi's an interesting guy. He's into a lot of really cool things. And what I like about what he gave us this evening, he's not just looking at it from a pure football perspective, as I think is the natural impulse here on a college football sure. show, right? He he tends to look at the entire individual, learn the learner. You heard him say it a bunch of times. He's really a deep guy and comes at this from a fresh perspective. And I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it can get easy to sort of look at players you cover as commodities, right? Like, oh, this is the the best running back. This is this offensive line is garbage, and that they're just sort of pieces that we move around and talk about. But Yogi does, I think, a really good job of of understanding the people he covers and, and it spends his time around. So, a really welcome perspective, I would say, especially when you know we all have to deal with idiots like you and I. Exactly. All right. Well, Daniel, I will see you on the weekend. I'm, I'm excited. So excited I, I'm um, I'm going to put the pool together. Okay. We'll be hearing about that at some point. You're not having a traditional wedding, at least not as traditional as mine. So it's it's pretty. There, it's not as out there as you think, Ty. It will be it will be a unique challenge for me as wedding. You're going to come are. hungry. I will come hungry. Uh, this is going to be a good one, Ty. And I'm told there will be enough food. I'm told there's going to be. It's a big band, Ty. There's going to be a big Great. dance floor. Great. Uh, we've got. I think the the location is ideal, so I can't imagine anything is going to uh, to get in your way of having fun. All right. Don't forget, again, propercloth.com slash solid. Go there today. Get a custom-fitting shirt. Mm-hmm. If you enter the gift code solid, you will save $20 on your first shirt. Ordering a custom-fit shirt has never been easier thanks to Proper Cloth. For that guy over there, my good friend, soon to be married, Dan Rubenstein. For myself, Ty Hildenbrand, thanks again for tuning in. We'll be back with you next week. In the meantime, stay solid. Peace.